What's up, Flatirons? My name is Ben. I'm glad you've joined us here today. Uh, so throughout the, the year, we're, we're taking opportunities to hear from guest speakers that we don't usually hear from. So we, we've contacted pastors all throughout the country that we respect and that we trust, and we told them, hey, could you come and teach our community? And like, if you had one thing that you could tell the Flatirons community, what would it be? Teach on that. And today is one of those guest speakers. I'm really, really excited for you to hear from this person. Um, as always, if you have questions, you can reach out online or through any of our social media platforms. But I hope you enjoy and I'm glad you're here. I'm very excited to introduce our very first guest today. Uh, it's a dude I respect who's been an integral part of a church that I love and respect and I'm thankful for. Our first guest today is a guy named Chad Brueggemann, all right? Chad uh, was one of a few people who here in Colorado started with scratch, started with nothing, and through him and a few other people, God built a church called Red Rocks Church right down the road, right? I love that church. I love that church because they're on the same mission we're on. Right, this mission to create an environment where you can be messy, you can be broken, you don't have to have it figured out, you don't have to have all the insider Christian lingo, you can come in here and understand that Jesus loves you, he's for you, and he wants good for your life. And I love them because they're doing the same exact thing we're doing and they're doing it in the same geographical location, in the same cultural context. Um, I, I'm deeply humbled and honored that we get to hear from Chad today. And so please help me give our friend Chad a warm and loud flat irons welcome. Last one. Do it one more time. Yep. My friends, Flatirons, how you guys doing? Good? Yeah. All right, we're doing that again. How you guys doing? Come on, good? Yeah. Someone told me the 11 was the rowdy one, and I'm starting to question it, so let's see what you guys got, all right? I know you don't know me, and if you think this is weird for you, hey, it's way more weird for me. You should see it from my perspective, all right? No, you guys are beautiful. Before I go any farther, though, let's do this. Let's make sure all the other campuses of Flatirons uh, are welcomed, and everyone who's watching online, man, we love you guys so much. Uh, you do need to get to church next week, but we love you, even watching on Facebook and all that stuff. You count, too. And then can you just do this? This is one of the neatest things that you guys have started doing at this church in the last year or so. Can we give the single most gracious round of applause to all of the men uh, at God Behind Bars campus in Lyman. Can we do that? We love you, gentlemen. We love you. Such an honor that this church gets to worship with you guys week in and week out. Such a neat thing you guys are doing. I, uh, um, Let's see, I started uh, coming to Flatirons uh, 14 years ago. We moved here to plan a church, as Ben said, and um, we had 18 people and a dream, and that was it. And it was a really vulnerable, difficult season. And so when there were Sundays when our church was really young, a couple hundred people it started growing to, and uh, if I had to preach on the weekends, a lot of times on Saturday night, I would drive up north to here, and I would sit in the back, and I would worship with you guys, and just get my heart ready to go and preach and pastor to our little church the next day. And it was such a beautiful thing sitting uh, in this huge church. It, even at the time, which is now even bigger, because as a young pastor who, who was really scared, God, every time I sat in one of the chairs at Flatirons was speaking to me about what was possible. If, if a bunch of men and women of God just committed to being disciples and making disciples and preaching grace and preaching truth and lifting up Jesus unapologetically, I saw that in Flatirons and it fueled me. And I am forever grateful. So think about the fact now that I get to all these years later, stand on this stage, and I have the honor and the privilege to, to brag on Jesus for a few minutes in front of you guys. I know this is just a normal week for you, but for me, this is a really big deal. And so I just wanna say from the bottom of my heart and also speaking for Red Rocks Church, how proud we are to, to call this church one of the churches in the Denver metro area. You guys have kind of been like, I would say like a big brother to us. And so thank you, thank you, thank you. You have incredible pastors. When we were uh, just starting out, we, we, we cold called this church and we asked if we could meet with the leaders because we were just a bunch of young guys that don't know what we're uh, doing. And they actually said yes, nothing in it for them, definitely didn't have enough time, but guess what, they made time. And they drove really far to meet us for lunch and they actually paid for lunch. That's the leadership that you guys have. And so I love this place. You guys are sitting in a really, really good 
church. I'm going to get started. I got to do one more thing before we get started just to make this a little less awkward because uh, I want to get to know you and you and me. Do you guys care if I show you a picture of my family? Is that cool? This is, someone's like, no, all right, okay, but I'm going to anyways. That's my family. That was a couple weeks ago at a wedding. I made him throw up the, the peace signs. You see that little four-year-old down there? Yeah, he's in the kids' ministry right now. He, we wouldn't let him come in here because this wouldn't end good. I do, have, I do have four kids. That's Jude and Jane and Ben and Cruz and my beautiful wife. Uh, we have four kids. We definitely should have had two, so pray for us. We love them all, but we should have had two. Stewardship issue. Two of them are on the front seat, so you two, we're gonna keep you. Jane and Ben, you're in, all right? The other two, though, I don't know. And I'll save the best for last. Uh, this is the, probably the single greatest gift that God has given me in my life, and that is my wife, Rachel. I was blessed to marry a woman from outside of the United States, so that mixes it up, and it keeps it kind of fun. She is from these kind of obscure little country down south of the United States called Alabama. Have you heard of it? <laughs> You guys heard of it? Roll Tide? Yeah, and so that's neat. We go visit, we get out our passports, and we go to Alabama. And it's, I'm kidding. Am I in trouble after this, or are we good? We gonna have a fight tonight? All right, I love you so much. I'm so sorry. It just comes out when I start talking. I love you so much. Alabama's great. All right, let's move on. We need, to, we need a Bible bath. We need to get in the world. All right, so, so I'm just gonna jump right in and, and talk to you guys for a few minutes. Uh, about five and a half years ago, um, I went through a really dark and difficult season, had a really dark moment uh, five and a half years ago, I, I turned 40. <laughs> and all the midlife crisis men said, amen. There was a lady, okay, cool, it, that works too. I'm staying out of it, but that works too, that's cool. And, I, and I, I, I thought to myself, there's no way I would ever have a midlife crisis. Here's why, I'm Pastor Chad, I read the word. I know my identity in Christ. I have a pretty consistent prayer life. I know how to renew my mind. I've been doing this for a few years now, so of course I'm exempt from the midlife crisis. That's for those pagan men, right, who buy the fast cars and cheat on their wives and do all that stuff, Not, nothing like that. But then I woke up on my 40th birthday and I had an incredibly vivid memory and it just wrecked me. I had a memory of when my parents were 40 and I was a little kid. And I remember thinking this when they were in their 40s, I'm like, my word, they're dinosaurs. Like, why are, they, why are they even still living other than to feed me and take care of me? Like, they're so lame, they're so boring, they basically have one foot in the grave because when you're a little kid, 40 feels that way, right? And now I have little kids and I'm just turning 40 and I wake up that day and it's not the fun birthday that I thought I was gonna have on my 40th. It started messing with me and boom, enters a midlife crisis. Bible says, right, be careful when you think you're standing firm, lest you fall, right? And I was falling hard. This is how hard I was falling. That day, I drove to the mall and I walked into a store, and it's an amazing store, amazing company, but no 40-year-old man should be walking into this store. I walk into a store called Pac Sun, Pacific Sunwear, right? <laughs> I don't need to be, my, I, I now shop there with my teenage son, right? Like, I, I should not have walked in there, but I'm like, I'm not gonna get old. I refuse to be what I thought my parents were when they were 40, so let's just go and let some teenage person dress me, all right? So I walk in there, and I meet this girl. We'll call her Lizzie, because that was her name. <laughs> I, would <get> to, <laughs> I would get to know her over the next uh, year pretty well, and I'm not proud of that, but I would. And I walk in, and she kind of greets me not as nice as she would greet the younger people, because she's kind of wondering if I'm actually in the wrong store. She's kind of looking at me like, hey, you know Eddie Bauer's like four stores down, right? Like, she kind of gave me that vibe, but we became friends, and I told her I was there to get some, some new clothes, and she's like, all right, what do you want? And I go, I want some jeans, and she goes, okay, just uh, I'll show you what we got. And I, I said, I, I really want, Lizzie, I really want some of those, um, uh, uh, the skinny pants. I want skinny pants. And she goes, what? I go, you know, the pants that are like skinnier and stuff. And, and she's like, you mean skinny jeans? I go, yeah, that's it. I knew that. Yep. Skinny jeans. She goes, okay. And so she starts helping me find jeans in my size. I should have told her like nine sizes bigger since they were skinny jeans. Right. And I have no business. Look at me. I have no business. These ham hocks. I, I need, I need stocky jeans. All right. Like I'm ready for Paris and Milan and New York to declare stocky jeans. Cool. Right. I'm ready for that right now. Okay. But it's not happening. So I, I, I get some of the, the skinny jeans and I, I walk back to try them on in the dressing room. It was the walk of shame, and I didn't know it at the time, but it's midlife crisis, so don't judge me. And I go back there, and now, I never thought I'd say this uh, sentence in my life, but the skinny jean technology now has gotten much better. They're, they're, like, they're, they're like wearing Spain. It's actually pretty comfortable. But five and a half years ago, when I walked into that store, it was old school denim. 
just really tight jeans, right? And so I go, I go in there and I put, I put the first jean on my leg and it doesn't go past the calf. And it's not going to. It's denim one, Chad zero, right? Because it just didn't bend. And I'm sitting there and I'm mad. Now, the rational thing you do in that moment is you put your foot back down, you take the pants off, you hand them to Lizzie and you go, I'm so sorry I came in here. I'll talk to you later. I'm gonna go to Eddie Bauer, right? Where I belong, get some cargo pants, right? And I, and I, and I don't do that because of pride, right? And so I just sit there and I'm, I'm going like this and I'm 40 now, so I have no core strength and I start going to the right, right? And, and I know pastors are notorious exaggerators. I, I'm telling you right now, I am not exaggerating. I, I go over and I hit the wall and I fall, right? In, 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 in a lot of vulnerability, right? And, 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 and I hear this from Lizzie, I hear this, oh my gosh, are you okay, sir? I'm like, do not call me sir, I'm a young man, right? Like, she goes, are you okay? I go, I'm fine. She goes, are you sure? I go, no, I fell. <laughs> and I just, I finally got out and, and I handed her the pants and I walked out of there and, and I, I'm five and a half years in now and I don't know where I'm at on the spectrum of midlife crisis, but young men, listen to me. It is a real thing, all right? Be prepared. And I remember when I was walking out of there, I started laughing eventually after I got over it because a few years before that, when the, those jeans actually came in style, apparently, we did a series at our church called Skinny Jeans. And more important than that was the subtitle. And the subtitle was this, comfort is overrated, right? Because when, when it comes to life, you, you get one of two things, fashion or you get comfort. But you don't get both, right? Ladies wearing high heels, can I get an amen, right? You don't get both, you gotta pick. Do I want fashion or do I want comfort, right? And the reason we did that series was, was real simple. We wanted to teach our church for four weeks about the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of this world because we live in both right now, right? And Jesus comes and he, he inaugurates what the kingdom of God looks like and all of the principles and all of his teachings and the way he lived. But then we still live in a very real sin-stained, fallen, broken world. So we just wanted to do four weeks on, on hey, we're gonna just talk to you about the radical yet beautiful nature of the kingdom of God. And one of the things we mainly wanted to tell them, which is why we did that sermon series, was listen, the kingdom of God is always in fashion. And I say the same thing again years later to you guys, Flat Irons Church. The kingdom of God is where life and life to the fullest is found. And there's no plan B for life and life to the fullest that Jesus came to give back to us. There's no plan B on, on how to find that than the pathway of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so we just, we just wanted the church to know this. It's that the kingdom of God is always in fashion. But listen to me, it is rarely comfortable, right? You wanna be a disciple of Jesus? Even there was one time where, where a bunch of people were so romanticizing all the miracles Jesus were doing that they wanted to follow him. And so Jesus kind of said, yeah, but do you? Because it's not always like this. And I'm gonna be leaving in a few years anyways. So do you really wanna follow me? He would say stuff like, yeah, do you? Because foxes have holes and birds have nests. But the son of man doesn't have anywhere to lay his head. And one by one, a lot of people would kind of fall away because the teaching started getting too hard. The principles of the kingdom started getting too hard. And you want to know why? Because although the kingdom is always in fashion, it is rarely comfortable. And so I say that to simply say this. I want to spend my, my minutes with you because they said, talk about whatever you're most passionate about, talking about one aspect of discipleship, one aspect about the kingdom of God that God is wrecking my life over in all the right kind of ways the last several years. And it comes from a phrase or a term that is used in the New Testament. And we'll start with Jesus using it. It's this phrase, are you ready for it? Because we're gonna, I'm gonna say this 50 times in the next few minutes. It's this phrase right here, peacemaker. Peacemaker. It is an integral part of being a disciple of Jesus is being a peacemaker. Jesus said this in Matthew 5, 9. He said, blessed. Now that word in the, in the English language, when we, when we try and define what he meant, here's how we've defined it. Happy, fortunate, to be envied. That's what, the, that's what Jesus was saying when he said blessed on the Sermon on the Mount. He said this, blessed are the peacemakers, Flatirons Church, for they will be the true sons and daughters of God. They'll be the children of God. You really wanna be a disciple? Here's one way you will know you are, and the world will know you are. You will be a peacemaker. Jesus' uh, half-brother James, a couple decades later, was writing a letter to the church uh, in Jerusalem that he was leading, and in James chapter three, verse 18, listen to what he says a few decades later. Peacemakers, there it is again. Peacemakers who sow, that means it's proactive in our lives. Peacemakers who sow 
in peace will do what? Raise a harvest of righteousness. And you're human like me, and so here's what I know about you even though I don't know you. You want a harvest of righteousness. I don't think you at any of our campuses would be sitting and attending right now if at the core of who you are, you didn't wanna be a real disciple. I know it's there, no matter where you're at in life right now. You wouldn't be here right now if, if you didn't wanna live for something more than just yourself, something eternal. And Jesus says, you really wanna harvest with you to heaven? You really want some things to transcend the grave with you from heaven that you can bring with you? Okay, here's, here's what it's gonna be. You, you're gonna have to be a peacemaker because peacemakers who sow in peace will raise a harvest of righteousness. Here's the problem, though, with peacemaking. When I say that word, most people romanticize it and go, oh, yeah, that's great, peacemaker, because we think hippie kind of love and peace, right? We think it's like this passive, just stay out of trouble, keep everything copacetic and cool. I just saw the Lion King new movie, right? It's Kuna Matata. It's just like, no worries, man. No, no, listen to me. What you're thinking of is peacekeeping, not peacemaking. And I know those might sound interchangeable, but listen to me. There is a big, big gap between what it means to be a peacemaker and what it means to be a peacekeeper. And listen to me, Flatirons Church, Jesus was not a peacekeeper. He did not say, blessed are the peacekeepers, for they will be the children. He did not, James did not write, right? Peacekeepers who sow in peace will raise a harvest. No, here's what peacekeepers who sow in peacekeeping raise, safety and comfort. And, and let me make this balancing statement before I go any farther, lest you think I'm preaching at you today, like I've got this all figured out. I am not preaching at you, I am preaching with you because I am by nature, like some of you, a peacekeeper by nature. I am not a peacemaker. I'm more past, I don't want people to not like me. I, I've, 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 it's an exercise in futility, but I have spent a, a too long of my life trying to get everyone in the room to like Chad. And that's a peacemaker in me. And I do not like drama, and I don't wanna be around drama, and drama exhausts me, right? And so my natural inclination is to just do my part, keep my head down, be a good citizen, look the other way, hang out with people that think like me, believe like me, vote like me, look like me, live where I live, right? Because it's safe and we're keeping the peace. That's what we tell ourselves. The problem though is Jesus was not a peacekeeper. Jesus was in a constant state of what I call holy troublemaking. And then he invites us to do the same kind of thing. There's a quote, it's a peacemaker quote in my opinion. I love it. A couple years ago, we were on a, on a short vacation and my wife and I were with the kids and she was just reading through this book, going through it like a hot knife through butter, right? And again, she's from Alabama, so I'm already nervous that she's reading in the first place. And so I'm like, <laughs> heat, I was just seeing if you're listening. You guys got quiet and I go, I wanna do a heat check real quick. And now we're gonna go to counseling next week for that. But it's for the, it's for the people, babe, so come on, give me some grace, all right? It's for the people, roll tide. Anyways. <laughs> Anyways, so she's reading this book and she's passionate about it. She's talking to me about it. And I'm kind of like, I'm, I'm like, I, I read for a living, babe. Could I just, we're on vacation. I want to go on the water slide, right? Not talk about your book, but whatever. It's cool. And, and in this book, I finally got into it with her because she always wins. Husbands, write that down. Just let her win. All right. Just let her win. All right. And, and in this book, like many books, modern books, you know, when, when they get to a new chapter, a lot of times authors will put an inspirational quote up top or like a verse or like or a pithy statement because they're kind of foreshadowing what they're gonna write in that chapter. Well, I get to chapter four of this book. It's a book called Braving the Wilderness. It's written by a psychologist out of Houston. She's now become famous because she gave a TED Talk and it went viral. And she's now a multiple times over New York Times bestseller named Brene Brown. And in this book called Braving the Wilderness, which is an incredible, incredible book, I get to chapter four and her inspirational, her pithy quote was so good that it stopped me in my tracks. And I'm gonna pass it on and I'm gonna build from this right now. She said this, people are really hard to hate close up, so move in. I'm gonna say that again. I might say it 10 more times before we're done here. People are really, really hard to hate up close. So move in. And, and I remember reading that and I'm thinking, Jesus, why wasn't that in the Bible? Why didn't you say that in the Sermon on the Solomon, you wrote a whole book called Proverbs of one-liners that just are amazing. Why wasn't that in there? Because that's Jesus thinking. 
That's exactly what Jesus came to do. You realize that, right? Jesus was not a peacekeeper. If he was a peacekeeper, he would have stayed on that throne because he was sitting in a place called heaven, which we are told from the word of God is a place of perpetual perfection and peace, right? Peacekeepers don't get off that throne to subject themselves to some crazy star called earth in the Milky Way galaxy where a bunch of people are trying to kill each other and be mean to each other, right? You don't do that. You stay up there and you intercede for him. Hope things turn out all right. But he's not a peacekeeper, he's a peacemaker. And so you know what he does? He gets right into the middle of our mess. He subjects himself to this world by placing himself in the womb of a teenage girl. And he goes to the most unlikely place at the most unlikely area with the most unlikely people and he moves into all of the places and all of the people groups and all of the ones that his tribe would tell him when he was born, he's not supposed to get near. And you know what he would do? He would change their lives forever. When Jesus first started his public ministry, let me remind you, here's what he said. He said, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. You remember that? Like I'm, my teachings are going to split households. My kingdom is so fundamentally opposed to what we were born into and what we've been trained and taught subconsciously that when I start preaching and when you start seeing me do what I do, half the people are going to want more of it. Half the people are going to run the other way. He goes, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. Now we know the good news. One of the last things he said before he went to the cross three and a half years later was, now my peace I give you, my peace I leave you. But here's what I know about peacemakers because I learned it from Jesus. Peacemakers are always willing to get a little punished on the front end to bring a little peace on the back end. Do you remember Isaiah said it? He prophesied it, he said, the punishment that brought what? You and me peace was upon who? Jesus. Did Jesus deserve our punishment? Come on, we're all, we know that. We call it grace in the church. He didn't deserve our punishment, but this is what peacemakers do. They're bold, they're courageous. They do what's right first and they take the consequences later, right? And so Jesus, Jesus comes down and he gets in all kinds of holy trouble to show us that he does not hate us. That the God of the universe who spoke you into existence and knit you together in your mother's womb is not mad at you and he does not hate you, but he came down to say there is a very real problem called sin and I'm gonna show us what defeats sin. I'm going to bring reconciliation and peace back. But listen, I'm gonna have to cause a little holy trouble first before we have some reconciliation. And then he invites us on our small little levels to do the exact same thing. Let me give you a few examples. You, you remember the, the famous story in the Gospels of the woman uh, at the well? She had to go to the well. If you're, if you're new to church, I'll, I'll give you some cliff notes so you, you understand this. She had to go to the well at noon in Samaria because she had been divorced five times. And she was working on number six, the Bible tells us. So in that culture especially, that gave her the scarlet letter D. So she had to go get water at the hottest time in one of the hottest regions in the world at noon when all of the other women in the life group who kicked her out for her bad behavior, we're getting it in the morning when it was a lot cooler. Now there's a really interesting thing in that story that usually gets skipped over because it doesn't seem like at all the point. But it is the point and it's in the beginning when it says Jesus walked right through Samaria and we usually just pass right on that to go like get to the neat part with the woman. But do you understand the implication of the statement that is being made? We're being taught about what a peacemaker is like, what peacemakers do. Because they had historically, in a few of those roads you can still see in the Holy Land today, they had uh, Jerusalem and Samaria very close to each other. And if you do the history check, Jews and Samaritans were arch enemies. They were for every reason, racially, ethnically, politically, spiritually, they were fundamentally at odds with each other. They could not dislike each other anymore, always on the brink of hostility and war. So here's what they did, and you're gonna think this sounds smart on the surface, because so do I. They built roads around the cities so they never had to walk through each other's towns so there would be no conflict. Doesn't that make sense? Doesn't that sound wise? You know what they're doing? Peacekeeping. Brilliant. Who doesn't want that? But Jesus is going, this isn't, like if you guys still hate each other, you're not really keeping peace. You're just avoiding conflict. And in the kingdom of God right now, I didn't come to bring peace, I came to bring a sword. So guess what, I'm gonna stir some stuff up. So so here's what peacemakers do. While peacekeepers walk around the problem, peacekeepers, peacemakers walk right into the middle of it. And our, our leader, our rabbi, our teacher of the kingdom of God shows us that when he walks right in and he sits with that woman and it is a triple whammy for him to do that. Here's why, he is a rabbi 
And the minute a rabbi walks into Samaria, he becomes ceremonially unclean. And if you go back in the scriptures and read what it would take to become clean again, I mean, that was an inconvenient thing for him to do and he does not care as a rabbi. He walks right into the middle of it and becomes unclean. And he's making a point about peacemaking and reconciliation. And then he does a second thing that's even worse. He sits with a woman. And I hate this fact, ladies, but 2,000 years ago, women were just barely above property. It was, if you think it's a man's world now, it was a man's world back then. He sits with a woman. Now he does the triple whammy. And Jesus doesn't do anything arbitrarily. He knew exactly what he was doing and why he was doing it. He sits with a woman who's been divorced five times. You understand the minute he sat with that woman in that town where he is not supposed to be according to society and culture and get this church, religion, the minute he does that, that's one of the catalysts that would eventually get him crucified. You know what he's doing? He's holy troublemaking because that's what peacemakers do. Peacemakers don't walk around situations to avoid conflict. Peacemakers walk right into the middle of places that culture and family members and, and, and religions have told them they're not supposed to be and they say, what do we gotta do to make this right? Like, think about it, Flatirons Church. When Jesus told us to pray that heaven would come to earth, he wasn't praying that we would sit around and say that and then look for a miracle. He he knew what happens to our hearts and our minds when we start praying something every day over and over. Eventually, you have to participate, right? That's what prayer does. It draws you into participation. And so when Jesus says that we pray, heaven come to earth, He knew if we could globally do that day after day, week after week, eventually your heart is going to woo you into actually being a part of the plan, being a part of the change. And that's called being a disciple. But listen to me, when you're bringing peace into a place that really doesn't have peace, it's going to cost you something. It's going to ask some courage of you. It's going to ask you to give up some things. It's going to take away a lot of convenience from you. It's going to put your reputation many times over in this lifetime on the line. You are going to be misunderstood and misjudged for some of the relationships that you proudly have with people you were told as a good Christian you're not supposed to have. But that's where the real work is done. And he steps in and he sits with her. Because peacemakers don't walk around problems. They walk right in the middle of them. Remember the woman caught in adultery? Let's, let's give another example here. Remember the woman in John chapter eight? It's a beautiful narrative. Implications through the roof. She's caught in adultery. Now the power players, politically and religiously, are going to use God's book, the Torah, to justify killing this woman for the worst mistake up to that point of her life. It's interesting they don't bring the guy who committed adultery with her along, according to the Torah. So we know they're not using the Bible for holy reasons. They don't care about justice. They're using this woman on the back end of her worst mistake as a pawn in their religious game. It's sickening, right? Now, if Jesus the rabbi was a peacekeeper, he just stays out of that situation and says, I'm not happy that girl's about to get stoned to death, but I can't get involved in that. There's too much politically and religiously at play. I gotta work with these guys. I can't tick them off, right? He's not a peacekeeper, though. He's a peacemaker. And he came to let stuff like that not happen anymore. So we we know the story. He gets right in front of her and says, let any one of you who hasn't sinned cast the first stone. And he's the only one there that's sin free that could actually justly kill her. And instead, what's he do on the back end of her worst mistake? He defends her. And this is what peacemakers, this is what we do as disciples. We defend people that on paper fundamentally do not deserve it. And we ask questions later. Defend first, disciple later. This is the template Jesus gives us, right? He defends her. Uh, Eventually, all the haters would go away. He turns to her and he asks her this beautiful question. He says, he says, woman, and don't say that in 2019, but back then that was culturally appropriate. He goes, woman, has anyone condemned you? And she looks around and no one's there and she goes, no, sir. And he goes, neither do I. The one who spoke the galaxies into existence knit her together in her mother's womb, looks at her and goes, best news ever, neither do I. She is a day away from her worst mistake ever. She's as vulnerable as vulnerable gets. If there was ever a time to be guilty and sad and condemned and feel awful about your ever living self, it was that day and her creator comes to her and says, I don't condemn you. And and Jesus' disciple, Paul, a couple decades later would say this, therefore now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because Christ Jesus, those who are in Christ Jesus have been set free from the law that was trying to kill her, from the law of sin 
and death and he was using her to preach the gospel. And then he would finish it on the cross, right? And this is, what, this is what peacemakers do. We defend people, whether they deserve it or not, first, so that hopefully we can call them to discipleship later. Because Jesus, Jesus didn't just say, hey, you're fine, go back to committing adultery. If they stone you, we'll do this again tomorrow. See you later. He doesn't do that. He says, sweetheart, come over here. Like my daughter, look at me. Don't do that anymore. I want you to go and I don't ever want you to do that again. It almost got you killed. Do you think I put that in the 10 commandments? Don't commit adultery to ruin your fun or to hold you back from living a full life that you think you deserve? No, I put it there so you could live a full life. This isn't Jesus going light on sin, but can I ask us this as, as peacemakers in this room, not peacekeepers? If the creator of the universe sees fit to earn trust in a woman's life, when he can do whatever he wants, however he wants, whenever he wants, right? He is sovereign king, Lord of all. He doesn't have to earn anyone's trust. He could pull her aside immediately and rebuke her strongly. And, and, and he never disciples her until he first defends her. And that's really nice in church to, to learn about. And it is incredibly difficult to go out there and actually practice, is it not? That's why this peacemaking stuff's not for the faint of heart. Peacekeeping is, peacekeeping will keep you there. But, but we're not called to that because Jesus was never that. Listen, someday, if, if, if there's sermons in heaven, and if I'm being honest, some of you will appreciate that. I hope there's not. I hope that's not necessary, right? We've heard enough down here, all right? But if there's sermons in heaven, here's what you'll get a bunch of, peacekeeping sermons. You know why? Because there'll be perfect peace, and we'll need to talk about keeping perfect peace. But right now on this planet, and in a bunch of our hearts and minds right now, we are lacking peace. So I didn't come to give a peacekeeping message. I came to give a peacemaking message. And it is not discipleship for the faint of heart. Think about this, one more, just to drive home the point. Do you remember when, when uh, there were some moments in the scriptures where Jesus would, would heal a leper, right? And it's, it's nice and it's easily romanticized and it's, a, it's always a quick, nice story in the gospel accounts, but there's an implication that a lot of times we don't think about, and it's this. To, to be even near a leper, you had to go outside of the city limits because they had what were called leper colonies. They had this peacekeeping kind of treaty, unspoken yet very real. Hey, we're all gonna die if we touch you, so would you mind living on the outskirts of town, right? And, and let's take it to a whole new level of judgment. The Jews back then believed that if you had leprosy, it wasn't like some kind of uh, sickness, it was a curse from God because they just didn't have the medical science we now have. They didn't know that it was actually something that you didn't have to actually walk through, that it was actually curable, right? That we don't actually, it's not even an epidemic anymore. It still happens, but it's not an epidemic. They didn't know any of that, so they thought you were literally cursed by God. So for Jesus to have even a moment or two where he's healing lepers, do you know what that means? He had to be out in the margins. He had to be out, 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 he had to be out with people that, that society told him, you stay away from. Because not only if you touch them, there might be some natural consequences, they're already suffering from spiritual consequences because look at them, God has clearly cursed them so we don't wanna have anything to do with them. And then the ultimate peacekeeper comes down to earth and says, no, 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 you gotta understand people are really, really, really hard to hate and stay away from close up, so move in. And that's what Jesus does with lepers, he moves in and he touches them and they're healed. And I, I picture a bunch of peacekeepers that really wanna follow Jesus, but they're really, they're really wanting to rebuke him and tell him, you, you can't do that, you're gonna catch leprosy. And I picture Jesus going, oh, 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 I'm not gonna catch leprosy, they're about to catch Jesus. And I'm gonna put, my, I'm gonna put danger on the line for that, you watch. And then here's the neat thing, of course Jesus does that, but here's what's crazy, he calls us to do that. Paul in Romans 8 would say this, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, what? Now lives in us, flat irons. And that's neat to quote at Easter and get excited. But have you ever really stopped to take time to think of the implications that the, the spirit, the driving force of Jesus's behavior, now is the driving force of yours? If you will subject yourself and submit yourself to the beautiful, precious, gentle, kind, but very real Holy Spirit. He will say, hey, there's gonna be moments if you're a peacemaker, not a peacekeeper, where you find yourself in some earthly precarious situations. But if not us, who, right, church? If not us, who? Like at some point, we have to let courage win the day. 
whatever that looks like for you, because you have the spirit of Christ in you to go and have the power to do things you don't even think you're capable of doing relationally with other people in this world. Sometimes you just gotta put it all out there for God and trust that he's got you because you're doing the right thing and Jesus gives us this model when he goes up and he heals those lepers. He's saying, I go places that the rest of the world won't go and now I'm inviting you to do the same thing with those people because guess what, those people deserve it. Here's why I'm so passionate, here's why I chose this message. Of all the messages I could have given to you on my, my time at Flatirons, here's why I chose this one. About 12 years ago, I got taught by a very unsuspecting teacher about how to be a peacemaker. And I wasn't looking for it and I didn't know I needed it. It was God's grace teaching me what it meant to be a disciple through a person I never would have thought or called a teacher. 12 years ago, my wife and I had the privilege of buying our first home. And you all live here, so you know, it's a big deal to buy a first home in Denver. It's not a cheap state to live in. Can I get an amen again, right? right? And so we, we go and we look at all the houses. We were poor church planners, so I don't even know how they gave us a loan, honey, but we got one. And, and we're in neighborhoods that fit our budget, and so I'm saying this nicely, but the neighborhoods were a bit sketchier than we would have liked with young kids, but it was the best we could do. And, and, and we got to this house that met uh, pretty much all of our standards for what we were hoping for, except one thing, the neighbor. The neighbor's house was so unkept. You, you know what I'm talking about? You guys, we've all had this neighbor before, you know, the neighbor where there's like five cars in the, in the, in the driveway and none of them work, right? We've all had that neighbor, no, right? If you haven't, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying, <laughs> call a tow truck, people, come on. The house was never, it was probably 60 years old at the time. The house, uh, our neighbor's house had never been repainted. The, the bushes were so unkept. There was no mowing going on. And it was just like, our hearts kind of sunk because we're like, we really want this house, but I don't know that we want to live next to whoever they are. But we signed, we, you know, by God's grace, we did it. We signed the thousand papers, good Lord, that you've got to sign to, to get a new house. And we started moving in. And on the day we moved in, I would finally meet uh, our neighbor. And his name was Cliff. And I'm, I'm out there with my friends and family and we're moving everything in. And I kind of got my head down because we're just getting after it. And all of a sudden I hear the door screech and it clanged open. And out walks Cliff. And Cliff is a character, let me tell you. Cliff doesn't have a shirt on. He's got totally unkept hair. He's got the jankiest, nastiest beard. I've ever, like, uncut food, probably food. You could tell he was inebriated. He had jeans with holes in them, but not the kind you pay for at PacSun, right? Like, <laughs> like, they're the jeans that have holes because he hasn't had a new pair of jeans in like, like 10 years, you could just tell. Work boots with holes in them, and he stumbles out. His first words to me are this. Hey, you're not gonna call the cops on me, are you? <laughs> And I, I look up and I go, uh, I really hope not. I'd like not to, should I? I mean, is this a thing? I have a hunch it's a thing because it's literally the way you introduce yourself to me. So I probably might call the cops on you, but I really don't want to, you know, I'm thinking all of this. I don't say anything. I'm just looking at him thinking all of this. And he doesn't, I never, I never said anything to him. And he looks at me and goes, good. And he walks back in the house. <laughs> so I would proceed for the next year to not say a word to Cliff. And he became this neighbor and quit acting all self-righteous flat irons. Don't act like you don't know this neighbor, okay? It's the neighbor where you're willing to be late to work because you'll peer out the blinds and if they're out there, you'll just wait because God forbid you have eye contact with them or a conversation, right? And you're just like, come on, I gotta get to work, but I can't talk to you because I don't like, right? Cliff was that for me for a year and I'm not proud of that. I was a pastor at the time. I was a pastor at the time, I'm not proud of that, but, but everything about him was ruining my, my, my homeowner experience and it made me mad and then I got a call one day randomly from my wife and I was at work and she's just kind of frustrated with Cliff because of his alcoholism and our young kids playing out in the front yard and, and him knowing be driving drunk and stuff like that and our kids are, are little at the time and so the papa bear kind of came out in me and I drove home a little early and, and Cliff was out and so I had a talk with him and I was fired up and I said something to Cliff that to this day I deeply regret. But I said it, I looked at him, I said, Cliff, listen, I, I'm a pastor, all right? I'm, I'm, I, I'm a Christian and I have a value, like the second biggest rule we got is love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. And I really wanna do that and I think I have a lot to offer but you're making this really, really difficult on me, Cliff. 
I was like, you're, 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 you're drinking nonstop and then you have the audacity while my kids are out playing to get in your car and drive away. And I said, Cliff, listen to me, if you do it again, I'm not calling the cops. I said, I'm gonna kill you. Yeah, exactly, right? P- Pastor Chad, great job, <laughs> great job. I said, I'm gonna kill you and I walked away furious. And I was five minutes into my house and usually the Holy Spirit gives me a little time before some discipline comes in, right? But not this time. I'm five minutes in and I start to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, go forgive Cliff. And I'm like, I will absolutely not forgive Cliff, Mr. Holy Spirit. I love you, but I will. Cliff needs to come over here and forgive me for like a thousand different things. There's no way I'm going over there to forgive Cliff because then he'll also think his actions are okay and I'm having this talk and I've done the dance with God just long enough at this point to know he's gonna win in the end. You just obey him, like the sooner the better, right? Because God, God's got your best interest in mind. And, and I finally humbled myself, and thankfully, by God's grace, and it was grace, I, I walked to his door, and I looked him in the face, and I said, hey, Cliff, man, listen, I'm so sorry for what I said earlier. Don't get me wrong, I'm mad. Wish you wouldn't do that, but I'm really sorry. No one deserves to be talked to like that. I disrespected you, I'm sorry. And I, I looked at him and he had a look in his eyes that, that shocked me. I don't even really fully know how to define it. But it was, it was like something sobered him, like something changed in him. Like he, he, he looked at me like no one has ever said sorry to me in my life. I'm always on the other end. I'm always the screw up. I'm always the dysfunctional addict that's saying sorry to everyone else. Did you, did you a, a, a upstanding, functional person, come to my house and proactively say sorry to me? He wasn't saying all this, trust me, he didn't have that vocabulary, but, but he's <laughs> like, that's the look he gave me. And, and, and something in our relationship changed that, that day. Like a seed was planted in my heart and the relationship, without even me knowing it, it took years for me to realize this, the relationship was, was switching. In, in God kind of fashion, in kingdom irony kind of fashion, because here's what was happening. Cliff was, without even knowing it, becoming my teacher, and I was becoming his student that he was, God was using for his glory. Remember when he kind of says he uses the foolish things of the world, the, the weak things of this world to shame the people that think they're wise so that they can actually get real wisdom? This, this was Cliff for me, this, this heroin addict and this, this guy who told me many times that he's just drinking himself to death. And here I am, the, the, the church planning pastor and the church is growing and, and I'm the student and, and Cliff is the teacher. And you know what he's teaching me? You know what his specialty is? Peacemaking. Because up to that point, I, I'm telling y'all, I was a peacekeeper and it wasn't serving me well. It was making life a little more comfortable, but it wasn't making it meaningful. And so something broke that day and I started getting a, a little heart for Cliff. And one day I'm out mowing and my son and I, oldest son, he was five at the time, we had a tradition. He would go in our old, our old suburban, it was a big old truck and he would pretend like he's driving while I'm mowing. And so I'm mowing and I'm mowing away from the car and away from Cliff's house, a strip. And then I get done and I turn around and I, I look up and sure enough, there's my son having a full on passionate conversation with Cliff hanging over the car, just talking to my son away. And I shut the, gra- uh, the, the mower off and I'm like, all right, just go have your moment with Cliff again. And I'm about to tell Cliff, Cliff, get away from the boy, right? Like your, your breath alone could make him an alcoholic for the rest of his life. Just leave, look, we'll all be your friend, but leave the boy alone. And, 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 and at the risk of over-spiritualizing this, but I really believe this was a God moment because I started to have some thoughts. You ever have that? and you know the thoughts are more profound and mature than you're capable of, I started having a conversation in my head and I, I saw something, I was like, I started almost laughing because I'm like, he, he's so comfortable and so at ease, like I've never seen him before talking to a five-year-old and yet he can't do that with me. And I felt like God in my heart was having this conversation saying, there, there's probably because maybe sometime around that age, Chad, his emotional growth was stunted because of something so dark that happened to him, like so many children. In fact, people would share that same story as children sitting all throughout this room and at all the campuses right now. You know that. You know what it was like to be a little kid and have something really, really dark happen to you. And I started getting more compassion for Cliff in that moment. And it was a little conversation with God where God stopped me and said, don't go kick Cliff away from Jude. He's in his sweet spot right now because he's about emotionally five years old. And he wasn't blessed to have all the therapeutic help that so many people by God's grace do end up getting to have. 
He hasn't been able to work through the trauma. So he put his trauma into beer and into heroin. And it's not been good for him and other people, but that's Cliff's story. So why don't you get to know it a little bit? Because Flatirons, listen to me, here's the deal. Here's what peacemakers do. Peacemakers get past all of the rubble of bad decisions in people's lives. We, we, get, we, we, get, we get past all of, all of the debris of people's mi- biggest mistakes and sin patterns and quirks and isms and personality differences and all the things that make us not wanna be around other people that God created. But here's the deal. God says to peacemakers, you're the people I'm gonna commission to be the people that pull the rocks and the rubble and the debris away. You're going to be the people, if you're going to be peacemakers, who are going to, are going to take the cliffs and you're going to peel back all the layers. Because if you, if you do that hard and it's going to be hard work and it's going to be inconvenient, you're going to get judged and it's going to cost you something. But the more and more you pull back, eventually you will, even on people like cliff, you will hit pay dirt because guess what you'll run into once you sweep all that debris of sin and mistakes away, you will see an image bearer of God. You will see someone that I beautifully and passionately knit together in their mother's womb, Cliff included. So Chad, here's what I want you to do with Cliff. I want you to move in because Cliffs are real hard to hate close up. So go move in. And I started having conversations in my garage after I mowed. That was kind of our unspoken thing. When I'm done mowing, Cliff, let's have life group. And he'd come over and I started to learn that 10 feet away in Cliff's house, when he was a little kid, he watched his mom die of an overdose. And I learned that years later, Cliff's only wife he would ever have died in that house right there, that unkept house of an overdose. Started to make sense. I wouldn't want to maybe paint that house or care for that house or mow the lawn at that house either after what that house represented for me, right? But, but I, had to, I had to lean in and move in to get to know that about Cliff. So instead of self-righteous judgment and disdain, I would have compassion that only Christ can give me, right? So here's my teacher telling me more and more stories about him. And then one day, um, so precious, by God's grace, I got to pray the prayer of salvation with Cliff. And I got to preach him the gospel in my garage. And, And I didn't know this at the time, but I know it now. I had spent a whole lot of time defending Cliff when he least deserved it before I had the audacity to try and disciple him. And God was teaching me the rhythm of his grace, the rhythm of how his kingdom works. There were some moments, Cliff was uh, by trade, uh, actually really gifted carpenter, but no one would hire him because he would go to the bids drunk. And he, had so, he looked so bad. So finally one day as we got closer, Rachel, you remember this, I said, I'm going to buy Cliff clothes and I'm taking him to dinner and I'm getting him a steak. I'm tired of this, I wanna help him get a job. And so I took him to dinner and we had steak and you could just see this, 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 this thing called dignity rising up in him and that's a powerful thing, folks. When you're an agent of helping someone have dignity again, it's a powerful thing. And I started seeing dignity come back. And we went and I said, get whatever jeans you want, skinny, chunky, whatever, holy, whatever. (laughs) Just make them nice, because you need to be presentable. Get the most expensive, we went to the work boot store and we got the most expensive red wings they had there. And he was proud and his shoulders came up a little bit for the first time I'd ever seen. And we had a moment eventually, and I wasn't happy about this because we were poor church planters, but God said, give him your Suburban. He needs room for his tools, give him. And so we gave him the Suburban, right? And I didn't know it at the time, but all I'm doing is honoring my teacher. My, my, Cliff, my rabbi, teaching me the ways of Jesus and not even knowing it. He's helping me, so I'm like, well, I, I gotta honor him and, and help him. And then one day, uh, about a year or so after, I got to pray with him and preach him the gospel that we are justified by grace. I said, Cliff, listen, here's the gospel in one sentence. I, if I only had one, here it is. We are justified by grace through faith. It is not of yourself. It is a gift of God, lest any man should boast. And I said, Cliff, you can't earn salvation, so you don't have to worry about your addiction. You don't have to worry about your bad decisions. You don't have to worry about the dysfunction, all of the hurt and all the pain, all of that stuff that, 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 that you've told yourself is your identity. You can now have a new identity simply as a gift in Jesus Christ. And we prayed and it was real. I promise you it was real. And then about a year later, I open up the blinds one Saturday morning and there's eight cop cars outside of Cliff's house. And I didn't like it because protocol with Cliff was two cop cars. Typically, right? Like we had a thing, we knew their net, right? It was two cop cars and eight cop cars are outside of Cliff's house. 
And my wife and I looked and it bothered us, but we kind of went back uh, with our day. And then we looked out the blinds again and they were still there. And then we look out the blinds and, and more sirens and it's, a, it's, it's an ambulance showing up. And I'm like, oh, this isn't good. And, and we're just kind of starting to get a little more nervous and we keep looking out. And then eventually one time I look out, you remember this moment as well as I do, babe. I look out the window and out comes Cliff in a body bag. And I knew exactly in that moment even though I hadn't talked to anyone yet, I knew exactly in that moment what happened. I knew that Cliff had took his life because I'd had so many conversations with him about how hard, he's just hanging on by a thread. His addiction is destroyed. Some of you, come on, we're all addicts to some degree in some way, right? I love how all these churches have addiction recovery on Friday nights. I'm like, we have that on Sundays. It's called church, right? <laughs> we're all addicts. It's just a spectrum issue. He was an addict and he was in so much pain and I had a hunch no matter how, how hard I, I was trying and who, who knows who else was trying, I just knew this was probably inevitable and it ended up happening. I just remember praying and talking to my wife and I'm no theologian so I'm not making a theological statement because I'm not a theologian and if you don't like this statement, it's ben at flatironschurch.cc. <laughs> But here's the statement. I just said, God, I pray Cliff is in heaven. Please let him be in heaven. Please let your grace be greater than anything we can even preach about and talk about. The depths of it, the riches of it, the width of it, the length of it, the height of it. I pray that your love and your grace would be so good because I know why Cliff turned out the way he turned out and I'm not excusing his behavior, God. But man, man, I didn't have to go through anything like that. And he was trying, God, would you put, you know, and, and I just felt God going, why wouldn't I want Cliff in heaven? He's been suffering in hell long enough, right? And I started to feel it, started to feel at peace. And all these years later, as I get to tell this story and I feel all the emotions come back up, I'm so grateful for Cliff. Think if I would have in my self-righteous judgment that I had for him, think if I would have dismissed him and just kept shutting the blinds when he was outside. Thank, you, thank God for his grace to woo me. Like literally pulled me as, as Jesus, our rabbi does, pull me into a precarious situation to teach me what the kingdom of God is all about. And he used the most unsuspecting character. And I propose to you this weekend, Flatirons Church, that God wants this process for every single one of us. It's to his glory and honor that we have cliffs in our life. Most of the time, the reason we don't is we're not looking for them because religion has told you a lie that there's certain people to be around and certain people to stay away from. And I'm here to remind you what you deep down in your heart already know, Flatirons Church, which is if not us, who then? If we're not in the middle of the biggest messes of people's lives and culture's lives and nation's lives, Jesus said, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. That's peacemaker language, but it takes courage. And I know this church has it. And I'll preach my heart out for a church of five or 5,000, but when I get in a big church like this, I get excited for one reason, math. If, we get, if, we get a, if I get in a church this size and we have a commission to go out of these doors and be a peacemaker, the math alone tells me we can change this county, we can change the Denver metro area. This church alone with its sheer size, if we say we will be the church that is a peacemaking, not a peacekeeping church, this will not be a holy huddle. This will not be a museum for saints. This will be a hospital for cliffs, for sinners to walk in by God's grace and walk out better than they walked in and to feel welcome. You already are this church, all right? I'm not coming here because I think you all need to, 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 I'm coming here to reaffirm who you already are. And I'm saying in this, in this season that you're in right now, continue to be that and watch what God does. And not only that, you deserve it. You deserve it to put yourself in some really precarious, holy troublemaking situations to watch what Jesus does on the inside of your heart. I promise you it's worth it. A bunch of you are already doing this. Some of you, this will be the first time. Would you all stand? Because I'm gonna ask who wants to, to sign up with me to be a peacemaker, be a part of this. So with every head up and every eye open, because this is a Me Too church, we want to look around when there's a response. So you go, oh yeah, you too? Oh, okay, I can do this then. If you're in here and you're like me, you say, Chad, I'm a little nervous. Chad, maybe I'm like you. I'm like a peacekeeper by nature, but I really, I, I feel the Holy Spirit challenging me. I want to be a peacemaker, but I need grace, which is power. It's not just forgiveness. Grace is power to live holy. I need grace from God. Guess what? He will answer that right now. 
but would you respond? Would you raise your hand at every campus and say, I wanna do that? Come on, every campus, all the campuses right now. God behind bars, men, proudly put your hands up. If there's ever a place where we need peacemakers, it's where you guys are at right now. It's your job there right now that you're a Christ follower. Men at God behind bars, keep them up. Look, look around, this is us. This is getting me so excited for, for the residual holy damage this is gonna do to our society because of the decisions you guys are making right now. So Jesus, would you please give us the power and would you, Jesus, please give us the strength to be everything that you need us to be to not only recognize our cliff when he comes or she comes our way, but to be everything that you want us to be for them. May we have the courage, may we have the tenacity, and may we have the faith by your grace. It's in your name we pray and everyone said... I love you, Flatirons. Let's worship one more time.